stand let's have a word of prayer and we'll take time to greet one another father one thank you for this day it's a cold wintry day outside but we thank you for the safety that you've given each of us for being here thank you for those who are here today lord we ask your blessing on them we pray for our time together it's very important and uh, we're grateful for this place that we have to gather here and all that you've furnished with us father may today just be a great day not only for us but for you also as we gather together lord as we start out a new year we look to you to guide us to direct us and to bless us that we might be able to be your children and to live according to your will and to do what you want to do as individuals as family as a, and as a church body we especially ask your blessing upon us today as we just gather here and we pray all this in your son's name amen
slowing down. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. When your love ran red and my sin washed white, I heard all to you. I heard all to you. times in life where we get lessons where we don't really expect them where they come from uh, I did something a little crazy on Christmas Eve I went and got a puppy insane I never realized how much like toddlers they were but the lesson I got from that is patience uh, if, if you've ever had a puppy you know that again they're just like toddlers uh, you have to be patient with them uh, this particular puppy uh, happens to like to walk around the house and explore, which is fine. And I thought, you know, I did that in my life too. I explored. I wasn't always a Christian. I explored different things in my life. Uh, things that sometimes got me smacked on the nose with a piece of paper. It's like a puppy that turned my life around. And I'm thinking, I've just learned two lessons from this puppy. Patience and that I can be disciplined. And then also what I learned from it is after a couple of days, you kind of learn to hang on to them, and you kind of learn to love them and forgive them, <laughs> just like God. He does for us. I'm pretty sure God would be really upset if I ate a pair of Jordans, which I would be if the puppy did the same. But I do know that even if that were the case, I'd have to forgive the puppy and teach it a lesson, just like God did me. He forgave me. And he taught me a lesson. So it's when we commune with him right now, that lesson that we learned is that we can be forgiven. We can go and ask for forgiveness. And this is our time to do it. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, we're all familiar with that. It says, For I receive from the Lord what I pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which I do for you in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's peace. That's understanding. That's knowing that we are saved by his grace, that he gave his one and only son for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the lessons that you give us in life. We just pray, Father, that we can learn from those and we can pay attention to what it is you're telling us, Father. And as we come to commune at your table, we just ask, Father, that we do it in the manner that you ask us to. We do this in remembrance of what you've done for us. 
Regardless of what we've done, Father, we know that we can count on your grace. And we love you and we praise you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning again, church, and Happy New Year. <laughs> it is not going to be a very happy new year for most of you, is it? So, <laughs> Tim, I sound loud. Can you turn me down a little bit? You know, I told you last week that uh, it was my goal not to um, give any more breaks for Revelation. I want to, we started last week back into it, and I really want to get into it and get past it. Man, we got close. Yesterday, I had my wife in the ER. And uh, she was laying there on the hospital bed, and I said, listen, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I can't miss another sermon, so you need to man up, okay? <laughs> and she's here. Only half that's true, okay? I did not say that, okay? What bothers me is some of you believed I did. Man, I saw your faces, like, you're horrible. So, <laughs> Sarah's over like, I could see him saying that. I didn't say it, Sarah, okay? <laughs> I, <laughs> all right. Now I can't deny that. Yeah. <laughs> can't miss this. All right. Grab your bulletin inside cover or inside. There's a handout to follow along. Grab your Bibles. We're in Revelation. I am glad she's here. She pulled some muscles and was in extreme pain. But uh, and I did not say that. I want you to know that. And it only crossed my mind once, Heather, that I might miss church. OK, but. All right, last week we barely got started looking at the sixth bowl of God's wrath, the drying up of the Euphrates River, remember that, and all that that involved in preparation for the coming battle of Armageddon. We only looked at one verse, verse 12, which told us who was coming to do battle, the kings of the east, and we established the fact that the kings of the east represent God's people. They come from the east. That's the direction of God. Several scriptures mention that, okay? In a spiritual way, it's the direction of God. They cross over on dry ground, which only God's people do throughout the entire Bible. We see only God's people crossing on dry ground. They are kings. And we have several places in scripture, including Revelation, where we are referred to as kings. Revelation says that all God's people sit on thrones, okay? So today we will conclude chapter 16 by finishing looking at the sixth seal, or the sixth bowl, excuse me, and then covering the seventh bowl. Let's get into it. Revelation 16, starting in verse 12 again. Here's what it says. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs, for they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. And they assembled them at a place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. All right, we already know the sixth bowl is drying up of the Euphrates River. Verse 12 is the kings from the east. We know that's God's people. Verses 13 and 14 tells us about the opponents of God and the opponents of God's people. Here they are. The dragon. He is the devil. The Bible tells us that. We don't have to even guess on that. The dragon, who is the devil, is going to meet us there, or meet us, spiritually speaking, figuratively speaking. The beast, this is the persecuting civil authorities of Rome. We've looked at that, the sea beast. 
Okay, and then thirdly, the false prophet is mentioned, who is the religious authorities of Rome. Remember back in chapter 13 after we saw the first beast rise up out of the sea? And then the second half of that chapter, we saw a second beast rise up out of the earth to support the first beast. This all goes back to chapter 13. And I told you then that the beast that rose up out of the earth represented Roman religion, and its purpose was to influence the masses to worship the Roman government, the first beast. I also told you that later on it would be referred to as the false prophet. You can check out my notes on that from that sermon. You'll see that I told you that, okay? This is the first place that the false prophet is mentioned. It's still mentioned in the, in the setting of a trio, okay? You had the dragon, the sea beast, and the earth beast. Now you have the dragon, the sea beast, and the false prophet. False prophet and earth beast are the same thing as far as what it represents. It represents all the false religion of Rome. John says that he saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, unclean spirits like frogs. That comparison to frogs, folks, is made because it would take their minds, these early Christians, it would take our minds, by the way, back to Egypt. The original oppressor of God's people. One of their false gods, Hecht, or actually a false goddess, Hecht, was represented by the image of the frog. And the second plague on Egypt was an attack on this god. Rome's oppression is compared to Egypt. That's not my take, that's the Bible's take. Uh, Revelation chapter 11 tells us that, that Rome is referred to Egypt, okay? We don't have to guess what the unclean spirits are because right here in verse 14, John says they are demonic spirits. And what are they doing? Well, they're performing signs in order to gather the kings of the world to do battle against God. Now, that is all that John saw. What does it mean? It means that Satan, in the form of the dragon, is using his puppets, the Roman government and Roman religion, to spew lies and to perform fake but deceitful signs to draw the world to themselves and against Christians. Folks, notice that it says that the demonic spirits assembled the kings of the world to do battle against God. These are not the kings coming from the east. That's God's people. These are the kings of the world. This is referring to all those vassal states that were under Rome's authority. And we know from historical documents that from one end of the empire to the other, orders were given from Rome to persecute Christians, and the governors of those provinces followed that rule down to the letter, okay? Butler says this, the false prophets of Rome kept deceiving the whole Roman world with their signs of Rome's invincibility and Rome's eternality so that all the subordinate kings of Rome aligned themselves or assembled themselves with Rome and I might add, and against Christians. And so to simplify this vision, John is told that they're all going to gather in one place, Armageddon, for the showdown, okay? Now, don't, folks, I've told you this earlier, I'm going to say it again. Armageddon is not going to be a real physical battle, okay? Do you really think that God of the universe has to have a physical showdown with some of his puny little creation to defeat them? This is the God of the universe who flooded the world by his word, okay? He can do what he wants. And listen, he's not going to have to fight physically against his, his creation. That is absolutely unnecessary. Christ shows up for real. And when he does, okay, there isn't going to be any conflict. I want you to understand something. Just because I'm saying Revelation does not connect with the second coming, do not say, well, Jeff Brown doesn't believe in the second coming. <laughs> yes, I do. Revelation has nothing to do with it. When Christ comes back, folks, there isn't going to be any conflict. Do you understand that? When Christ comes back, there is not going to be one ounce of resistance. By the way, each time that conflict is described here, there's always people left afterwards who hate God. That cannot be the second coming. Because when the second coming here, it is over. Do you understand that? It's over as life as we know it, as the earth as we know it, okay? When Christ comes back, there will be no conflict. There will be no resistance. How do I know that? Because Paul the apostle speaking on judgment day, Romans chapter 14 verse 11 says this, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. What's he say? Every knee will bow. There will be no conflict. There will be no resistance. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. Paul says the exact same thing again, Philippians chapter 2 verse 10. At the name of Jesus Christ, what's going to happen? Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Your only choice is this, either do it now or be forced to do it then. Do it now by your own will and volition or do it then by God's power. That's the only thing that's going to happen. There will be no conflict. There will be total submission to the name of Jesus Christ. The only choice you have is do I submit voluntarily or do I submit by force? 
Those who do not submit voluntarily now will submit by force on the day that Christ comes back. There won't be any battle, folks. That has already been won. The whole battle scene here in Revelation chapter 16 and again in chapter 19 is a spiritual battle. There's not going to be one great massive physical battle. It is described this way to show the magnitude of the spiritual battle that was going on then. Listen, Rome really did go all out to destroy Christianity. I've shared some of those things with you that they did to try and destroy God's people. They burned Bibles. They burned church houses. They burned Christians. But God's people still resisted and still survive. They scattered. They hid. They died. Hebrews Chapter 11 and other chapters talk about that, but they won. Armageddon represents the decisive conflict between the worship of Caesar and the worship of the Lamb. Verse 15 in your Bible, and I bet every Bible has this, a parenthesis around, does it not? It's a parenthetical, it, those belong there. It's a parenthetical thought. Here it is, verse 15 on your outline. It's a parenthetical warning to Christians to be ready for what's about to happen. Well, what's about to happen? Well, literally, hell's going to be unleashed on them through Satan. But they are not to give in. Why? Because Satan loses. But God knows how tough it's going to be on them. And so here's a warning. Christians, it's going to happen quick. It's going to happen violently. Look what he says. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. This is not talking about his second coming. That is used later. Not in this scripture. Not in this book. But that term's used in other places. Okay. But look what he says. Blessed is the one who stays awake keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. What's this all talking about? He's telling Christians, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to be tempted to give up. But if you give up, you're going to be shamed. Why? Because in the end, you're going to win if you stick with me. Folks, let me tell you something. One of the largest controversies in the church happened right after the Roman Empire fell. You know what the controversy was? What did we do with all those Christians who capitulated to Rome thinking we would lose? See, because when, Ro when Christianity was made a legal religion of Rome, all of a sudden all these Christians wanted to come back. People who had left the church, why? So they wouldn't get persecuted. So they wouldn't get put to death. You can read that in, in Christian history and Roman history. It happened. And then after it all happened, a lot of them, oh, we won't come back now. And so there was a huge controversy in the church. What do we do with them? The point here is you better not capitulate because you're going to be shamed if you do. Because when this is all over, when the smoke clears and the dust settles, <laughs> Rome has fallen and the church still stands. That's what he's getting at. See, it was absolutely unthinkable that the fledgling Christian church could survive, let alone defeat the Roman Empire. But that is exactly what's being implied here and declared here in this passage. And that's exactly what happened historically speaking. So right in the middle of this passage, God puts in a parenthetical warning to Christians not to be caught off guard. Listen, it's going to get tough. It's going to get rough. But don't give in. Why? Because in the end, you're going to win if you stick with it. See, Christianity's defeat of Rome took the world by surprise. Like a thief that's unexpected, their victory was unexpected. Literally, it was unexpected. This verse has no meaning if you don't keep in the context of what's going on with the rest of this discussion. During the great persecution, as I told you, many Christians did renounce their faith. Probably hundreds of thousands of Romans that saw the good and the truthfulness of Christianity, but never joined up. Why? Because to them, Christianity seemed like a lost cause, and then suddenly Christianity is victorious. Folks, this is a historical fact. I have already shared this with you, but I'm going to share it again because it is so important to the fabric of Revelation. Let me share it one more time. In 303 A.D., the Roman emperor Diocletian, not Domitian. Domitian is about to come up, but one of his predecessors years and years later was Diocletian, who was just as horrible. Diocletian declared that every Bible in the known world should be destroyed, every church should be leveled to the ground, and every Christian should be executed if they do not recant. That was in 303 A.D., okay? In that same year, or a little over that year, the persecutors thought they'd actually eradicated the Bible from the face of the earth. See, the emperor Diocletian had been told this, and rightfully so. He was told that this new religion that had been growing and growing and growing, growing called Christianity, he said, these people are people of the book. And if you destroy the book, you destroy the people. There's a church down the road here that needs to hear this, by the way. Sets out there on I-44. And their preacher literally said this one day. I know this for a fact because I saw his outline. We are Christians, not Biblicans. The Bible is not the foundation of our faith. The Bible is not essential. 
Hmm. Yet in the early Christians, they were so attached to the book that the emperor of Rome was told, you destroy the book, you destroy the people. And so he set out to destroy the book and the people. And by 304 AD, he had considered himself so successful, and I told you this before, that he actually, in his arrogance, took a burned Latin Bible and set it out for public display. And on top of that burned Latin Bible, he wrote these words, Extincto nomine Christianorum. The name of Christian is extinguished. That was in 304 A.D. I don't know why he did this. He was the only Roman emperor to ever do this. But in 305, he voluntarily abdicated the throne. In 311, his successor signed the Edict of Toleration, which ended official persecution of Christianity. That was in 311. In 313, the Emperor Constantine signed the Edict of Milan, making it the legal religion within the Roman Empire, and thereafter it became the religion of the Roman Empire. Now get this timeline here. In 304 A.D., the Roman emperor says Christianity is dead. In 313, nine years later, Christianity is the official religion of the Roman Empire. That's pretty quick, folks, going from dead to conquering the Roman Empire. Who in the world would have thought? Who could have known that that would have happened? I'll tell you who could have known. Every single Christian that read the book of Revelation and interpreted it correctly. Do you follow me? They would have known that was going to happen. They might know the fine details how it was all going to come about. But what if I told you is the theme of this whole book as far as what? We win. Yeah, the whole series is called Victory is Ours. Who would have thought that this would happen? Every single Christian back then who trusted and believed in God would have known it was going to happen. And by the way, let me say one more thing about this passage, then we'll move on, okay? If you take this passage literally, the whole passage literally, then verse 15 really doesn't mean anything or have any purpose. Because it still hasn't even happened yet, if you take it literally. All right, the seventh bowl represents the completed judgment on Rome and Satan. The seventh bowl represents complete judgment or a completed judgment on Rome and Satan. Let's read it, verses 17 through 21. Here's what it says. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been seen, uh, never been seen since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from the heaven on people. And they cursed God from the plague of the hail, because the plague was so severe. All right, verse 17. The angel pours the bowl out into the air. That's important. Why? Because it symbolizes that God's judgment permeates the realm of the devil. The realm of the devil is the air. How do I know that? Paul, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. That's not on your outline. You can write it down. Ephesians 2, verse 2. Here's what Paul says. The prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. He's talking about Satan. And so what's this saying here? Well, this angel takes this bowl of God's wrath and dumps it into the air. Why is that so important? Because the air is the realm of the devil. And what he's saying is that God is bringing judgment even on the devil. God has judged the devil for using Rome. We're also told this on your outline. We're told that there's a loud voice. What's that? It's commanding. It's attention getting, okay? That's what that loud voice is for. It came out of the temple. What's that tell us? It is from heaven. Because we're already told that the temple's in heaven earlier, okay? It comes from the throne. What's that tell us? It is God. And he declares it is done. What's he saying? Judgment is completed, okay? The fact that there's a great voice from the temple and from the throne emphasizes the finality and the absoluteness of the seventh bowl. The way that it is done has been written. It shows us that it is done, it has been done, and it will continue to be done. What's the Bible getting at? Rome is destroyed. She will stay destroyed. She will continue to be destroyed. She will never, ever come back like she has before, okay? That's what that's getting at there. God's judgment on Rome is complete. Verse 18 describes cosmic and geological phenomenon to symbolize God's judgment. It always means that. Thunder, lightning, earthquake. That's just referring to God's judgment. Sometimes literally, sometimes figuratively, okay? Remember this is figurative, not literal. 
In the vision of the throne in chapter 4, verse 5, there are flashes of lightning and peals of thunder. From the seventh seal in chapter 8, verse 5, when an angel took the fire-filled censer and threw it down on the earth, there was flashes of lightning and peals of thunder. In chapter 11, verse 19, when the seventh trumpet was blown and God's temple in heaven was opened, there was flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, and earthquakes and hail. Okay, now here in this chapter, coming from the seventh bowl is what? Lightning thunder, great earthquake, all of this is apocalyptic language commonly used by the prophets to describe God's judgment. In this case, it's describing God's complete judgment on Rome. Ezekiel uses the same style of language in chapter 5, Ezekiel chapter 5, verses 7, 8, and 9, to describe God's judgment on Judah because he was so disgusted with her. Listen to this, Ezekiel 5. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you are more turbulent than the nations that are all around you and have not walked in my statutes or obeyed my rules and have not even acted according to the rules of the nations that are all around you, therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I, even I, am against you, and I will execute judgments in your midst in the sight of the nations, and because of all your abominations, I will do with you what I have never yet done and the like of which I will never do again. Now, that's what Ezekiel says to Judah. Yet Jesus Christ himself uses the exact same language towards Jerusalem and Judea several hundred years later, Matthew 24, when he predicts the downfall of Jerusalem by the hands of the Romans. All of this, folks, is hyperbolic language, exaggerated language that God uses to describe his judgment. It's not to be taken literal, okay? It is used for effect. He did it in Ezekiel speaking of Judah. He did it in Matthew speaking of Jerusalem. He does it here in Revelation speaking of Rome. What is the effect that God wants to convey? That his judgment is complete and folks that his judgment is horrible. And in every single case mentioned that is exactly what happened. If you go to secular history, well some of it even biblical history, read about the downfall of Judah with the Babylonians. Read, uh, somebody, was that you just got the book, Josephus? Yeah, read Josephus, his book on the wars. He describes the downfall of Jerusalem by the Romans. You talk about a bloodbath. It was a bloodbath brought on by God for his judgment. That's what God's getting at here. He's not saying that literally hailstones going to fall on. Now, sometimes he did use hail. There's no doubt about that. But that's not the point. The point here is what he's saying is this. I'm going to bring judgment on this nation. And it's going to pay a horrible price. Verse 19 continues with the description of that judgment. Rome is split into three parts, okay? Division signifies complete destruction. And again, it uses prophetic language to get that idea across. Going back to Ezekiel chapter 5, this time verses 11 and 12, listen to God's description of Judah's destruction, Ezekiel 5. Here's what God says. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore I will withdraw. My eye will not spare and I will have no pity. A third part of you shall die of pestilence and be consumed with famine in your midst. A third part of you shall fall by the sword all around you. A third part I will scatter to all the winds and will unsheath the sword after all them. Now, God was not saying that literally one-third of the people is going to die this way, one-third of people is going to die this way, and one-third of people is going to die this way. In the same way that he really didn't divide Rome into three parts. The whole thing is a positive language. You're saying what? You're divided, I'm going to wipe you out. Some of this way, some that way, but you are going to be totally wiped out. That's what he's getting at here, okay? Verse 19 also shows us that Rome did not go down alone. Rome's allies fell with her. Everyone had been warned as to which side to choose, and the nations chose wrong. All the people of the Roman world who were seduced into drinking the wine of the wrath of her fornication, all those people who received the mark of the beast, Figuratively, not literally, okay. All of them were doomed with Rome. Verse 20 says, the islands fled and the mountains disappeared. This verse, you have to go back to verse 19. It is also using prophetic and ap apocalyptic language to describe that when God's judgment comes, there's no place to hide. There's no place to hide. True story. This couple was living in, I think it was Canada. Kind of disgusted with the world. Some of you aren't going to remember this, 
the fuse alive in 1982, you'll remember this. They just were discussed with the world. They laid a map of the world out, and they said, where can we go that we basically will not be bothered by humanity? I don't know all the criteria they used to pick the place, but this husband and wife, after looking at the map over, they made their decision of where they were going to go. So they packed up their kids, packed up their family, and in 1980 or 1981, they moved to a place that hardly anybody had ever heard of in the world called the Falkland Islands. Does anybody know what happened in 1982? England and Argentina went to war that's called the Falkland War over that island. What's God saying? Hey, when my judgment comes, there is no island you're going to hide on. There's no mountain you're going to go to. The islands will flee away. The mountains will dissolve. But I'll get you. That's what he's saying here. Folks, you can check this out. That same style of language is using Ezekiel 26, 18, Micah chapter 1, verses 2 and 4, Nahum verse 1, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 5, Psalms 97. All these places talk about the mountains being dissolved. Why? Because you're going to run there to hide, and it's going to do you no good. No one who deserves God's judgment is going to escape it. That's what this message is here, okay? Verse 21 says, hailstones. <laughs> They're just another element of God's judgment. Hailstones are used profusely throughout the Old Testament to describe God's judgment, both literally and figuratively. God literally used hailstones to destroy Egyptian crops and Egyptian animals in one of the plagues, okay? When Joshua fought the Amorites at the Battle of Gibeon, listen to this. Here's what God says. There were more, speaking of soldiers, there were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel could kill with their swords. <laughs> at the Battle of Gibeon, fought by Joshua. God, speaking to Ezekiel, tells him to prophesy against the false prophets of Israel. And in chapter 13, verse 11 of Ezekiel, he says this, There will be a deluge of rain, and you, O great hailstones, will fall, and a stormy wind will break out. Now here he's using the, the term hailstones figuratively, but my point is this. Hailstones in the Bible are consistently equated with God's judgment. Folks, this whole picture that you're being given today, the seventh seal, the, excuse me, the seventh bowl being poured out, what's the whole thing about? Rome had had her time, and God was disgusted, and he says, I am done with you, and here's what's going to happen. Every horrible thing I can think of, I'm going to do to you because of what you've done to my people. To conclude this sermon in this section of Revelation, chapter 16, I want to quote to you Jim McGuigan. Here's what he says. The whole ungodly world has been smitten. Evil has been searched out and thoroughly punished. The power behind it all, the God of this world, must be smitten also. As Revelation continues, and we have a few more chapters to go through, okay? As Revelation continues, we'll see the fall of Babylon dealt with, though it's already declared in chapter 14. We'll see the battle of Armageddon dealt with, though it's already mentioned here. We'll learn of the defeat of the God of this world, though the word is, it is done. God has buried Rome and her allies. Some of the elements of the bowls have yet to be developed, but they're all covered in the record of the bowls, chapter 16. The city fell under the seventh bowl, but the fall will be described in chapter 17 and 18. The battle of Armageddon is previewed here, but it will be developed in chapter 19. The devil has been defeated in the air, but his defeat will be developed in chapter 20. You could end your study of Revelation right here and still get the picture. You wouldn't get the complete picture. Why? Because God is not done showing, here's how I'm going to take them out. Let's stand. Let's pray, please. Father, I want to pray today, and I want to pray that each of us realize that what we read here in Revelation, even though it was done historically, to a very real empire, that your morals, your values, your concerns have not changed. And we know for a fact because actually what we see taking place with Rome was not the first time a lot of this had happened. You'd done it before to other nations, nations who had turned against you or gone against your will or hurt your people. And so we realize that there are still lessons to be learned from this passage, even though we know that it was done for a particular time in history. We know that Rome paid the price, but Lord, help us to learn from that. They paid a price because they rebelled against you. Lord, verse 15 today warns Christians that no matter how tough times get, we better not be found naked. 
We better not be found without having faith in you. Because you're always a surprising God. On numerous occasions you have said this, that you will be like a thief in the night. You will do things and you'll show up in unexpected places at unexpected times to do unexpected things. And we as your people are to trust you and continue to live faithfully. Father, I pray that that's the message that we'll get from this today. As we look at Revelation, as we, as we looked at real life Christians who suffered some horrible things but stayed faithful to you. Father, may we have this inspiration in us to stay faithful to you because of what we see going on and because we see your faithfulness. Your word stands true. Help us to stand with it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.